Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou. Appreciate that very much. Appreciate what the Mises Institute does. There was a time when uh, the Mises Institute was just starting, and I helped a little bit in the early years. Our crowds were much smaller, so <laughs> I think the future looks bright, and that to me is, is very encouraging. I also want to uh, especially thank uh, the host for this luncheon today, and that's Carl Davis, and uh, he's, of course, at our table, and he's hosting this lunch, but Carl is uh, a good friend of Liberty, but he's a good friend of Carol's and mine, I'll tell you that, because as early as uh, back in the old days, I represented the 22nd district, which was a different part of the, of the uh, Harris County area, and he was a constituent then, but he's been a strong supporter in everything that I've done, so that I appreciate very much, Carl, and I'm glad to see you here today. Also, Lou mentioned that I would be continuing to work on foreign policy, and we've uh, organized a group uh, uh, which will be called uh, the Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and it will be run under the Free Foundation. But uh, I was fortunate in these uh, last uh, quite a few years in Washington to have an individual who was a real expert in that area, and uh, he will be heading that up, and Lou will also be advising us on that, and and that's Daniel McAdams, uh, who will be on that board and running it. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> you know, it is, it is great to be uh, here, and over the years it's always been great <laughs> just to get out of D.C., let me tell you, <laughs> because uh, the atmosphere is so different. One of the things that people often talked, uh, brought up to me was, uh, when in Congress, uh, or even now, they say, how did you ever put up with it? You know, how did you stand it? You know, because when you look at it and listen to it and see what's happening, and then trying to change the direction, they said, didn't you become frustrated and annoyed? It just, didn't it drive you nuts? And uh, I said, really, it, it, it didn't do it, because I think I, there, I went there with the proper expectations. <laughs> I didn't expect that I would change the world. Uh, matter of fact, I've been surprised on the upside that uh, we've, we've uh, gotten as much attention as we had. But uh, I think I was talking to myself to probably, uh, you know, rationalize being there, saying it, it's not quite so bad. But let me tell you, now that I've been home for a couple of weeks, I say, how did I ever put up with that stuff up there? <laughs> so, uh, but there, there have been some good things happen, happen in, in Washington when I see one, two, three, or four, five literally change the direction of what they, how they've been thinking. And in one case, uh, probably uh, one of my closest friends in Washington, happens to be a close friend of uh, Carl Davis's too, and that's the uh, congressman from North Carolina, Walter Jones. Now, Walter Jones was a typical neocon, and uh, he represented, uh, I think it was Fort Bragg, he represented many, many military personnel, and he just felt like he had to do this, this, this. And, uh, he, uh, he was the individual that when uh, <clears throat> the Iraq war uh, broke out, uh, he, he voted and supported it, and then he was the one that introduced this resolution to change freedom fry, uh, French fries to freedom fries, because he was annoyed at the French, because they weren't joining in the battle. Of course, the French are making up for that right now down in Algeria. But, uh, he, he, that's how annoyed he was. But shortly after that, and we visited quite often, and uh, he, it finally dawned on to him that uh, he, he was for the war because of one thing, they lied to him, flat out lied to him. He went to all the briefings and listened to him and all the experts and the CIA and the administration and the president on down, and uh, he, you know, believed what they were saying. But it didn't take too long, he found out they were lying. 
they were lying through their teeth about it. And then he started seeing the troops come back, the ones that were wounded, the ones that were killed, and all the harm. He knew about the uh, problems on the uh, military bases. So he, uh, he now is one of the strongest anti-war uh, you know, opponents. And uh, th this, to me, is, is a significant thing because that's what we have to do. We have to change, change people's mind and understanding. And uh, it, it became a, an important issue uh, for our campaign as well. Because as I uh, traveled around the country, so often the, probably, you know, the neocon average Republican would come up and many of them were, at least to my face, very courteous and, and polite. And they say, Ron, we really love what you're doing. You are such a good conservative. You'll vote against all that spending and everything else. And, and we really like that. But we could support you if you would only change your foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to explain to them, uh, you know, that the uh, college campuses and the young people in crowds like this, where would you be if uh, the foreign policy was that of military adventurism? This is a major part of our philosophy and very, very important. So I would say you give up our foreign policy and accept the policy of intervention. We've given up way too much and we should never give an inch on that. Washington has, uh, has not changed a whole lot, and if you measure what's happening in the, country, uh, in, in the country with what's happening in Washington, you could become a little bit depressed. And, uh, if, if you watch only uh, the major networks and TV, you might even end up throwing things at the TV. But we live in a different era, and, uh, and, and today you don't have to get your news off the TV. So if you looked only at Washington and not what's happening elsewhere, uh, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But, but today, a whole generation are coming of age that uh, don't get their information from the TV, and they get it elsewhere. And so life is changing. Uh, I've been in, interested in these ideas for a long time, and many of you I know share this. It wasn't so easy to get information. Uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, when I became fascinated with these studies, uh, it, was, it was hard to find the information. Uh, I was so delighted when I discovered uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, Leonard Reed's group. This was fantastic that, uh, that this was available. You could actually get a book and study and write off and get a book. Today, you can get a book instantaneously with a couple clicks on your computer, you know. Uh, so this, this is, uh, we live in the most miraculous uh, of times. Uh, you, you know, it was Vic, Victor Hugo said that you can't, uh, uh, you can't, you can stop an invasion of an army, but you cannot stop an invasion of ideas. And you know, when I first heard that, I was so excited about that because I'm really sort of a chicken at heart. <laughs> I had a life fighting and shooting and killing people. And if I thought I had to try to change anything by becoming violent, I didn't want any part of it. So when I decided that ideas are more powerful than armies, why not join the position of changing ideas and confront the people who have the military power so we have the greatest weapon in our hands for fighting? Washington right now are not much interested in some of the very important issues that are dear to our heart. Uh, they claim there's a lot of partisanship going on up in Washington. If you turn on the TV, there's a lot of partisanship. They yell and scream and fuss and fume and cheat and holler. And it's not all fake, it, it's for real because there's always an argument over who has the power. Murray Rothbard used to write about the banking industry, the, uh, uh, the Rockefellers, they'd be fighting with each other, but they, when it came to endorsing the Fed, they endorsed the Fed. And this is sort of the way it still is. Republicans and Democrats fight, fight with each other. But when it comes down to the important issues, 
Uh, there's way too much compromise, too much bipartisanship. We got into this mess because of the bipartisanship. But it was easy when the country was wealthy and growing and the prosperity and the momentum was there. We had a relatively good economy and free society and sound money, in spite of its imperfection, created the most massive amount of wealth known to mankind. And this momentum continued even as the underpinnings of that system was occurring, there was still a lot of wealth to divvy up. And so it was easy to compromise. Okay, uh, you want milk subsidies, we'll give you tobacco subsidies, you know, and vice versa. Uh, so there, was, there were no arguments. Now it's a true argument because uh, even our opposition realizes that, um, you know, there's a limit to this, except for Paul Krugman. He doesn't, <laughs> I don't think Paul Krugman thinks there's a limit, because if you're out of money, and the most important thing is people spend more money, and that'll solve everybody's problem. So if you don't have enough money, and the Fed won't print fat, or the Treasury won't borrow enough, just create a trillion dollar platinum coin and cash it in for a trillion dollars, and it'll be miraculous and all our problems solved. But guess what? A whole generation of people today, not only the individuals in this room, but a whole generation of young people on college campuses know that it's all a fraud, it's not going to work, and they're reading about the Fed, and they know there will be a day when the Fed will be ended. You know, I've been criticized on occasion for not calling an end to the Fed. Of course, I wrote a book called End the Fed, but I, I, they, uh, they don't like it because it sounds like softer, because my goal isn't to send the troops down there and get rid of the Fed. I'm just waiting for them to self-destruct is what I'm ready, ready, ready for. But the Fed will end. We shouldn't have the Fed. But uh, my thoughts are that we should work more on just legalizing the Constitution. And if we did that, oh, that's radical, isn't it? <laughs> just legal, legalize the Constitution, and then you wouldn't go to jail if you use silver for illegal tender. You know, today you go to jail. I'd suggest that we look at the, the uh, monetary, the uh, Coinage Act of 1792 and find out what the penalty was for, was for uh, uh, counterfeiting money. We who use silver today aren't the counterfeiters, it's the Fed that's the counterfeiter, and we should hold them accountable. But both sides support the Fed, both sides support the uh, military-industrial complex, both sides support the welfare state, and therefore the arguments are very superficial and distracting. Do you think the bankers and the military industrial complex and others really worried a whole lot during this last election after it was narrowed down to two? Which one won? Would it have made much difference? I, I don't believe there would be. It could have been any difference. But uh, there's still the, the, this whole fanfare of, of, of beating the drums of this competition. But I think that's our important job is to make sure that people know there's an alternative and uh, that we're not part of that system. And I think that's what's happening. Uh, for, for, some, for some very special reason, the, those young people in college campuses, as well as all of you, because I don't see one person here over 30, so I think that is great. <laughs> and that is open, open to these ideas and now studying. Um, you know, it just, just sort of bewilders me when I have young people come to me. Uh, matter of fact, today I had somebody come up to me. He says, well, I started reading about this because of you when I was 14. Well, I have people coming to my office in Washington, and they say, you know, I started reading Murray Rothbard when he was 13, and they're reading now. Uh, believe me, you know, uh, if what uh, Victor Hugo said is true, which I believe, and ideas do have these consequences, we're on a roll as far as I'm concerned. I think it's going great. And a lot of people deserve, deserve credit. Sometimes uh, it's an individual talking to a family friend or a neighbor 
and sometimes it's a teacher in a particular school, and sometimes it's an, it's an organization or an institute like the Mises Institute that changes people's minds. And uh, this, is, this is what's been happening. And uh, I'm, I'm impressed with the growth of the numbers. I remember in 07, when uh, somebody wrote me into uh, thinking about running for an office, and, and I said, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll do it, but I can't see much coming of it, and uh, I gave them all those arguments. And uh, <clears throat> this information was, uh, was leaked out. It got out before I made the announcement that I would, would run in the uh, presidential race. So it got out, and, uh, and before I knew it, you know, it, it got on the internet. And then before I knew it, a lot of people knew about it. And I said, what's going on here? And they said, well, it went viral. And I said, viral? I never even studied viruses of this sort in medical school. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, is, uh, that to me was remarkable, but we, even what's happened since uh, five years ago. But uh, yes, the campaign was important, and I helped some, but believe me, a lot of people were involved planting these seeds. And uh, when you th see the exponential growth that is uh, before us today, th this to me is so impressive. And it's not like it's the 14th district in Texas. It's not like it's in Texas. It's, it's not like it's in the United States. With the communications that happened today, you know, the other day somebody called me up and they said, when are you coming to Canada? We have a Mises Institute branch up here and they're all over the place. So this is, this is what's happening. And uh, I, you know, I have to tell you, I, I had a, you know, a, a little bit of personal um, delight in, in, a, uh, in that time when uh, Romney went to Poland. Anybody remember what happened when he went to Poland? <laughs> I don't even speak Polish, you know. <laughs> so maybe someday I'll go to Poland and meet those two people that were on up that sign. <laughs> no, but there's, there's more than two people here and there. Uh, and, and I think there's two reasons. I've talked a lot about the internet and the young people, but I think there's another reason why this is happening. And it has to do with where we are in a scheme of things. Um, the evidence of the 20th century is so overwhelming that uh, it can't be ignored anymore. The overwhelming failure of socialism, the overwhelming, literally, liquidation of this communist as uh, Marx and Lenin proposed. I mean, it died, and we didn't have to fight them. We didn't have to go in with armies. We went in with ideas and the failure of theirs. So I think it's the spreading of our ideas, but it's the failure of theirs. And I think this is what's happening. And it's the failure of our foreign policy that changes the minds of people like Walter Jones. And it's this failure of, uh, of government's credibility. Um, the other day I was on a college campus and uh, we had a nice crowd out. And uh, I asked him about how many here believe the, the, the government leaders when they make pronouncements from Washington. How many believe these things? I didn't see any hands. I know I don't think I'd get any hands in here, but, but a college campus is a liberal, liberal arts school. Nobody believes the government. I would say that's a healthy start. <laughs> you know, we all know the story about uh, the, the policy of, of Bastia. You know, you and I shouldn't do, uh, if the government shouldn't be able to do anything that you and I can't do. If we can't redistribute all steel, rob, and, and, and all, uh, the government shouldn't be able to do it. If we can't counterfeit, the government shouldn't be able to counterfeit. We're not allowed to use violence. The government shouldn't use, use violence. But you know, I wanted to, I don't know, this might be a radical idea, but maybe we can do it the other way, Ron. Anything the government assumes they have a right to do to us, we should assume we have a right to do that to them. Now, would it be too radical to say that if the government lies to us, we have the right to lie to the government? Do you have a gun in your house, and how many guns do you have? Do you have gold in your house? How, many, how much gold do you have in your house? Uh, so, 
It's, uh, I, I think it makes a point, if nothing else, and governments assume a role that uh, was never intended in this country, but it's been assumed that way uh, to one degree or another uh, for literally centuries, if not millennium. And most people say, well, it's, that's the way it's going to be. It's been that way for thousands of years. Governments are always too big, and they fight the wars and make innocent young people die. Uh, and therefore, you can't expect uh, anything different to happen. And I am so optimistic that I believe we can change that, or at least introduce this whole notion that it doesn't have to be that way. You know, if if Switzerland can go, what, four, three, four hundred years without actively fighting a war, why can't a lot more of us do the same thing? That's what I think we ought to do. <laughs> now, does that mean you don't, you give up, uh, you become pacifist and give up defense? No, you put an AK-47 in everybody's house. <laughs> Some people say, well, it's Switzerland because they're surrounded by mountains and it's a special situation and nobody ever wanted to invade them and they didn't have to participate. Well, didn't we have a pretty special situation and still do even in this modern age? Uh, you know, there's a lot of water between us and uh, any individual uh, that might invade us right now. I don't think there's anybody planning on invading us. I remember back in the early 80s, they were planning to build these huge tank, we were building more tanks. And I asked him, I said, why do we need more tanks? Are we expecting the Russians to come across the Bering Sea and invade us with their tanks? I mean, it just goes on and on, and uh, I don't think it's uh, too over the top to think that attitudes can change. I think two things have, have to happen, though, uh, to get it. I think we need more resistance from young people to say, we're sick and tired of it all, we don't want to fight your wars, and we're not going to go and be cannon fodder. We need more resistance to these wars. But we need more, um, we need individuals in Washington who have different ideas and different programs. And um, I think that would be worthwhile, but I don't, I don't think that would answer the question, because I think people abuse power what they get it. So if they're, if they're able to and believe they can use this power and get in those positions, and it is thought by the people that government ought to have this monopoly of power, uh, then I think there will always be abuse. I think we have to get to the point where we tell uh, anybody in Washington, you don't have this authority. You don't have this authority to run our lives. You don't have authority to run the economy. And you don't have authority to tax us and fight wars that we don't need to be in. And we don't even want you in off if it's that, is, that is the case because you don't have the legal right to do it. You know, one of the biggest problems, of course, is trust in, in Washington, and most of that uh, lack of trust is, is justified. Uh, but uh, the commentator, it was a commentator the other day talking to a, a senator about his promises, his, his oath, and uh, the senator answered, he's, and he was uh, changing his mind on his pledge to not raise taxes. And he more or less said, he says, I, I care much more about my country than I do about some, he didn't use the word stupid, but he was impressed, and some stupid pledge of 20 years ago I took not to raise taxes. And I think that is the attitude, because most of them either distort what the Constitution is, or they figure that's old fashioned, you just say it, they don't take it uh, uh, seriously. But they, he, he just said, that my oath and my promise doesn't mean anything. And that, that of course, would uh, uh, have, to, have to change. Another commentator asked the senator, he says, aren't you, because he was taking a position which for us wouldn't be, um, you know, <laughs> too, too, too much of a, of a step to take, but he was a conservative wanting to cut back a, li a little bit. And um, 
the, the commentator said to him, isn't this overly idealistic? Uh, why don't you live with reality? Well, the position of so many who are considered uh, you know, over the top on, on, on this, totally, overly I idealistic and not living up to real reality, um, what, what, what do they mean by this? Because in, in, uh, in, in truth, if we were concerned about that, wouldn't the uh, budget be something that's over the top? Isn't that extreme? Isn't that excessive? I mean, budgets and, and deficits of trillions and trillions of dollars, printing trillions and trillions of dollars of money, doing it in secret, and then they say somebody who wants to cut something by a nickel is, uh, is an extremist and over the top and radical. Uh, I think what we need to do is turn that around and show that the radicals, the extremists, those who believe bizarrely in ideas that we don't agree with, they've been in charge. It's time to change those individuals and change our attitude about what the role of government ought to be. Many years ago when I was in Congress the first go around, I remember uh, a conversation that I overheard. And it, a bill had been on the floor and the Democrats were strongly in charge and uh, Bob Michael was a Republican leader. And, uh, and yet there was a vote that was relatively close. And I don't even remember what the bill was, but it was relatively close. Uh, I guess some Democrats were defecting. and. Uh, Jim Wright and Bob Michael worked out a deal when Bob Michael was able to gather together some moderate Republicans and they came up and passed the bill. And I remember it, as soon as it was passed, Jim Wright came over to Bob Michael on the floor and he says, I want to really thank you for doing what you did because that was so statesmanlike for you to do what you did. That is, so statesmanlike to sell out. I think there should be a, defin a different definition for <laughs> statesmanship. But uh, I, I thought, well, this you know, really is the attitude and uh, uh, what, uh, what is the meaning and cooperation and compromise. I look at it more, not compromise that we need, what we need is coalition building. Uh, there's, you know, we're not going to have everything we want as fast as we went in government. There's no reason, I, I, if you're in politics, I think if you're not 100%, you're wasting your time. If you're in politics to move up on the ladder, that, that's a different story. But I think you should work with different groups like on foreign policy and civil liberties. You know, when I, when I first went to uh, Washington, if, um, if my decision had been that I wanted to have, you know, influence in the uh, typical fashion, that means you would have to move up the ladder, and that means you would have to vote the way leadership tells you to, et cetera. I was always amazed at individuals who might be voting pretty well and more conservative, and they get a position in leadership. I remember one time going up to the individual, and we were just having a vote, and he was voting the wrong way. I said, what are you doing? You're not voting with us today. He said, well, I can't do any more. I'm in leadership. <laughs> He's in leadership, so he has to do, do what he's told. But you know, if you work your way up the ladder, uh, uh, I guess if, if I'd have stayed on and, and had done that, I could have uh, become a, a chairman. But then the other concession you have to make, not only on all your principles, is you also have to raise a lot of money. I think a chairman said, and each committee has a different amount. Like ways and means, you might have to, wait, you might have to raise 10 or $15 million for the club, you know, for the Republicans. And then, if you don't raise the money, uh, you are never considered. So, I was, uh, unlike Walter Jones and three or four others, like they got kicked off their committee because they didn't bow to the leadership, I was never kicked off a committee. Um, because I think uh, the problem there was, and I heard Gingrich tell, say this one time, he says, well, we didn't do this because we didn't want to get too many emails from Ron Paul's <laughs> friends. <laughs> So he, uh, the, 
in, the, in working up the uh, working up the ladder is uh, is is really really the job that uh, they have to worry about. But uh, I I believe that uh, we're you, you know we're facing tremendous opportunities that we have, and and I think what's happening today is, is so so beneficial that uh, we 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 can't let up. Uh, Every, so often I get asked the question, what should I do? And I said, well, <laughs> you know, I said, just do what you want to do. <laughs> you know, uh, everybody has a different job, but everybody has a job, you know, uh, and some people can do one thing and not, not the other. Um, and a lot of young people will come up and uh, they'll be, you know, 18, 20 years old. And they say, well, I like what you did. I'd like to do what you did. How do I get into Congress? I said, how can I run for Congress? I said, don't do it. Don't set that as your goal. It shouldn't be your goal. You might end up doing it someday, but you don't want to set the goal of running for Congress. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, get you into Congress because of your beliefs, that's a different story. But uh, if you set a goal to move up the uh, political ladder, I think that's, that's very dangerous. Leonard Reed was great on this. He says, educate yourself, learn and study and know the issues. And I still believe I try very hard to understand all the issues and learn how to explain the issues. And, and that, uh, that is uh, very important. Um, Mises talked about that in Human Action. He talks about uh, some people are inclined to writing and, and studying and uh, um, on, on ideas and issues and a, a pure academician and, um, and others uh, are responsible for making those ideas palatable. And uh, I feel like I'm sort of in that category. I like the education. I have educational foundation. I promote it. But it seems like uh, I've listened carefully to what he said about taking ideas making them palatable to yourself so you understand that. Then it makes it so easy for you to get your friends and neighbors. And now, how many people in this room might have, have a Facebook, <laughs> you know, a, a few. So we, we literally, in a room like this, uh, or the numbers of people we have in this room, if everybody had a Facebook, we're talking to tens of thousands of people. A new definition for viral. Who knows what happens, you know, on how ideas are spread. So this, this is a, uh, a, a wonderful time. We have a wonderful philosophy. It's not complicated. It's based very fundamentally on what life is all about. Uh, I think life is precious, and I think life comes from our creator. And uh, if, if we think that we can defend all other kinds of liberties without the respect for life and the protection of all life, I don't think we can spread these ideas uh, as, as well of the ideas of liberty. But those uh, who, who expect to uh, uh, defend, the, defend liberty must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting liberty. And people who come to groups like this have already invested a lot of time and money uh, in, this issue, in these ideas. And I only encourage you, I thank uh, all of you for coming. I thank Lou for the invitation. And believe me, uh, I'm very encouraged and uh, in, in many ways, you know, I feel, I feel almost released in a way. I don't have to go through TSA quite as often. <laughs> other, other important events like that. So, uh, but I won't stop arguing the case why we need to get rid of the TSA as soon as possible. <laughs> but, uh, let me just close because I want to make one important point uh, that I, I think that so many respond favorably on college campuses. And that is, what is the concept of liberty all about? Uh, I'm convinced that 100 years ago or so, for some reason, we went off track and we took the principles of liberty and cut them in pieces. And we have uh, personal liberties and uh, civil, li civil liberties, and then we have the foreign policy sitting out there, and then we have economic liberty. And um, people who don't quite understand this, you know, go into categories and in different groups. But if you believe in the individual as possessing liberty, 
and not as a group, and you don't have group rights, you don't have gay rights, and you don't have women's rights or minority rights and all these things. You just have individual rights, and everybody deserves equal protection in the law regardless. But if we have that liberty, this means the individual is in control, control of one's own life. But it also means that what you do with that life is your own business. You re reap the benefits, but you also have to assume the responsibility and the consequences of your actions. Now, most college campuses left moderate or whatever, uh, the young people understand this. More challenging is when you go to Berkeley campus and get uh, you know, a nice crowd out and say, well, this is exactly the reason you have to believe in economic liberty. If you have a right to your life, you have a right to keep the fruits of your labor. And of course, if we have economic liberty and personal liberty, and we understand uh, the foreign policy, then we have a totally different foreign policy. We have a foreign policy of peace and prosperity. We cannot have, we cannot have prosperity when, with the perpetual wars. And uh, you know, they, uh, they claim that we're involved in war all the time, and they act like it because they're undermining our liberties all the time, and they call it a global war on terrorism. Uh, I think it's a domestic war on our liberties, and uh, that's where the real problem is. So I chastise myself and others for not having done a better job because we have a philosophy that I think is, I believe sincerely, is a correct philosophy, the philosophy of liberty. But how do we get painted? Uncaring, uh, we don't care about the troops, we're unpatriotic, uh, we don't care about the poor, and uh, we need welfare and, and all these things. And we lose, we lose the argument about humanitarianism that we, we don't have a concern for our fellow man. You know, if, if somebody accepts the libertarian position and does it in a selfish manner and does a very good job in taking care of themselves and never give a penny away, they are no enemy of ours. They're not an enemy. But the whole thing is, is the nature of most people is that they're very generous, you know, uh, with helping people and taking care of their families and all these things. But if you want a prosperous society, in a society where people can uh, promote their own excellence and virtue, you want a free society. If you want wealth, you want a free society. And we lose this argument all the time. We use it all the time. We don't care about people, and that's why the poor people need more help and you get more socialism. But I believe the argument has gotten easier. It's gotten easier for me because you give them wealth, you give the society welfare, you get Republicans and Democrats endorse it because they don't want us to be seen or called selfish or unpatriotic. But then when the crisis hit, when the thing collapses as it did in 08,